All right, so quadruple net value, that's an helpful. I just like have to think about it when I say it. Um, so rather than me tell you what um, all, you know, how this project relates to these concepts, I thought we'd have a, a discussion about it. I think we've given you a lot of uh, information about, you know, various aspects of the project that apply to this. So, um, so you got economic value, social and cultural value, environmental value, and sensory value. And so before I look out and no one raises their hand, I'll give you a piece of advice that I'm probably going to share with you at lunch, is to remember every day is an interview. So here's your chance. <laughs> um, so let's start with, uh, with economic value. So some of you have written papers and read about these things. So where, what, how are we creating economic value and who are we creating economic value for? All right. So are you saying how we're going to the table? Yeah, so, you, so you're both, you both touched on an economic uh, value or impact, um, but you haven't said what the mechanism is, right? So you said property values go up, and you said, you know, we're, we're creating, we're leasing space to restaurants and people. And so what, if, what is that financial mechanism that returns money to the community? Huh? Jobs, that's one of them, that's not the one I'm after. Property taxes. Yeah, property taxes, right? And sales tax, right? <laughs> Liquor tax, all of those things. And so if we're in, if we're if so we're creating property tax base, and we've taken a piece of property that was on the university tax rolls that doesn't pay tax, right? And we're now converting it to a private use, so we're generating a lot of property taxes. Um, and then to your point, hopefully we're providing, we're enhancing value for everything around us. So if housing values go up, unfortunately, you know, maybe they don't want their property taxes to go up, but they'll be happy when they sell, right? And then we're creating, you know, uh, um, sales tax, property, or uh, 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 alcohol taxes, and so, um, so we are inherently returning a lot of money to the community that then gets used in, in various ways. So, what other economic value? Yeah, so that's, I, I should have covered that in the structure. So, um, so the university did not want to sell property and I actually think by law they're not supposed to sell property. They're, we're a land grant school. Um, so we don't own, we didn't buy the property, so we ground lease the property. And so one of the benefits to the university versus just the fact we're creating something that hopefully is a positive impact on the university in terms of attracting students and faculty and whatnot, is we are leasing the property. So suddenly that property has gone from not generating any income to generating income. The other piece is it's a participating ground lease. So we pay a base ground lease rate, but as we are increasingly successful, the university gets to participate in that. And it's, it's interesting when we negotiated that deal, and uh, you, you have to appreciate our, our, our chairman is, you know, we found ourselves almost negotiate, negotiating against ourselves because, yes, we were the developer at the same time, we're, you know, we're Aggies. And so it was sort of like, well, what's good for the university? And we were the one that actually brought up the participating concept that said, you should be asking for this and we're okay paying it. You know? If we're all going to win, then let's all win and benefit together. And so, um, so that has been a, an economic impact to the university. Thanks. Any others? I think we covered most of them. Jeffrey, are there any missing economic impact? Well, I think the intent of the tenants, you're creating a value return yeah. for them too. Yeah, I mean, for the tenants. Yeah. The tenants that Bond talked about, right. these are tenants that would not be in participation. Yeah. yeah, that's right. We're, we're, we're creating uh, economic opportunity for the tenants. And we truly look at ourselves as partners with our tenants. Um, the, um, our job is to help them be successful, right? We're not just interested in getting a rent check and sort of saying, you know, you, you horrible tenant, you haven't paid your rent on time. If we do our job well, they're going to be successful, and our job is to help them be successful. And if we do that, then we're going to have opportunities with them in other places. And no different than the Texas A&M ground lease, we're incentivized to help them because we have what's called percentage rent, right? So they make their... They pay a base rent, but as their sales eclipse a certain threshold that we've agreed on, then they start paying us some more rent. 
So we have some tenants in city center that are paying more percentage rent now than base rent, right? So that's good for us. Um, so, and it, it is, um, I, I think in that, that idea of, I mentioned conscious capitalism, it is, it is that idea that doing the right thing and making money are not you know, mutually exclusive ideas. They are indeed one and the same. And if you can do that, then that's a real benchmark for success. All right, social and cultural value. <laughs> um, so, with this movie theater that's part of the project, I've been thinking about it. Other than having more amenities, nicer amenities than the other two in town, how will it be different than just having, there's already two big movie theaters? Yeah, so the difference is you can go in, you can have order a full uh, dinner at bar menu. One of the other things we love about them is if you think about the time frame in which a movie theater is used, right? It's generally afternoons, evenings, and generally even more on weekends. So they actually rent that space out as great meeting space. So if you think about this auditorium, not that different than a movie theater, right? So we could be having this presentation at Studio Movie Grill. They'll cater, they could cater the full, you know, we could have a breakfast meeting, they could cater a full breakfast. And so part of it is sort of how they view their business, how they run it, and the adaptability of it. I think they do a much better job also on sort of the events than in terms of they will they will show some movies that are not necessarily the standard movie, or maybe a standard movie, but then they'll build a whole event and, and, and social experience. So they might have the James Bond movie come, and they might have four Aston Martins out front, and they sometimes they'll bring in an actor, and so they, you know, it's a different experience. Um, the one thing I love about it too is you can reserve a seat. You go on, you buy your ticket. It looks just like an airline, and I could pick the seat you're sitting in. So when I show up, I don't have to come early, and I know exactly where I'm going to sit. That's a much better experience. And you know, years ago, we, we we have a lot of debates internally because effectively we're making an investment in the tenant when we lease to them, right? We're writing them a pretty big check for a lot of tenant improvements, and we hope they're successful. So inherently, as fiduciaries on our part, we need to understand the retail landscape. And so I remember going through City Center, and we had two big debates. One was about movie theaters, and one was about bookstores. And we came down on the side of bookstores that wasn't going to last, and we're not going to do that. Movie theaters was an interesting debate, because at the time, everyone was saying, oh, people are going to have home theater systems, no one's going to go to the movies anymore. And our assessment was, people actually do love to go to the movies, it's just a pretty crappy experience, right, in the scheme of things. And so, that's when we sought out, we said, okay, if we're going to do it, then let's go find a tenant who is delivering an experience, who is delivering something different. And so, um, we've had a wonderful relationship with them, and I think, you know, they will deliver something different in, in College Station. And um, so, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. So how do you see this plugging into um, what seems to be kind of a intensification of the North Gate Strip? Right. Um, starting with the rise. Yep. Um, and people seem to be against that. You know, yeah. people who grew up here um, went to school here a long time ago. Yeah. Maybe didn't like that idea, but now I'm starting to see a movement towards um, just increasing the density there. Yeah. Um, and possibly integrating it all the way down to the North Gate. Right. Um, and then back. Right. So, um, I think this is turning into more Q&A than answering the question. Uh, yeah, I thought I was asking ask, ask a question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll answer the question. Uh, so, I think there's one is, I, I think you have to step back and sort of understand demographic trends, right? And at the end of the day, I think a lot of what we're doing in providing urbanism, if you will, actually is providing something that, you know, the two big demographic bubbles, if you will, right? You guys and the empty nesters, you know. A lot of people don't want to get in their car anymore. It is about sort of connectivity and walkability. And so I think, you know, as I said, the, the university is the anchor institution in this city, whether people want to, you know, admit it or not, it is. It's the reason the town exists. And so proximity to that has value. And as property values go up, what is what's the result? Well, but not just development, what kind of development? Density. Yeah, density, right? I mean, that's just inherently, at some point, if you're paying whatever, $50 a foot for land, you can't afford to do you know, some big sprawling thing anymore. Um, and so I think it's going to happen. And, and it always happens in, in, in cities, whether it's 
sort of gentrification or not, the, the, the change in property values changes uh, typologies of development, which some people either, for whatever reason, either like or don't like. Um, I mean, look, at the end of the day, we're used to it. There will be people that don't like Century Square for whatever reason. That's just the reality of it. We think overwhelmingly most people will like it, but some won't. Some like things to be, right, stay as they are and, um, and not change. But that's the way it goes. <coughs> All right, back to social and cultural. Don't ask me a question. Uh, got one more for you. One more comment. Uh, yeah. So from that perspective, and going off kind of the same theme, uh, one thing, you know, most people don't argue here that Brian has the, the advantage over College Station, but one thing that I would say, being a Brian resident right now, right. is that we do have a downtown center. We've got, yeah, we've right. got downtown Brian. And College yeah. Station, uh, to me, having only been here for about six months, it's a collection of streets with individual locations, individual right. stores, individual coffee shops that people go to. But I do think that Century Square is going to offset that, and, and it has the opportunity to be kind of the beating yeah. heart off campus. Campus right. will always be the heart, but it does have that opportunity to give residents, people that are not students, yeah. uh, that opportunity to coalesce somewhere. Yeah, I Other think that's exactly people. right. I think that's that's probably the biggest social, social and cultural value we're bringing is we're delivering community. Right, a Absolutely. place where people will come together and gather and connect. And I think Brian's done a great job. We, you know, we looked at a number of the RFPs for for the work in Brian, and we kind of said we have our plate full with this, and this is what we should focus on. But I think they're doing a lot of the right things. And we, although we're in the city of College Station, we really try not to sort of differentiate. It goes back to that idea that for us, you know, we're trying to deliver a, a regional destination for a lot of people, and hopefully it has a, a positive impact. So. Any other ideas on? Yeah. Sydney. This is going to take a little bit. This is kind of out there for a oh, She's going to ask a hard question. No, it's not. <laughs> I recently had to pretend I was uh, Berkeley, just opposed to AM. Yeah. And make a comparison about strengths and weaknesses and all kinds of different things. Anyway, if you look at them, they're really actually polar opposites in that one is considered really liberal, one is very conservative. Right. One is very urban, one is rather rural. Right. Uh, but both, but neither are very diversified. Or, you know, they're 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 really not inclusive. If you look at, at their population, it's highly Asian yep. concentrated. In our, we don't have enough diversity in in, in, in the college station. So what what happens is that we really don't fight for faculty because they're going <coughs> to students because they choose to go where it's comfortable right. usually. Yeah. One of the things that this does is because now you start to create something that's more familiar to a lot of urbanite type faculty right. as well as students. They're more inclined to think, oh, this is not a put out place. Right. And we can actually, you know, maybe enjoy being in College Station. It brings to something that you know, has been missing. Right. Yeah, and I think that was Dr. Gates's kind of overarching vision when he wrote the, uh, I think it was the 2020 plan for uh, the university. Um, and I will say, you know, we, we've done a good job of it's attractive to everybody. And I, I love, we office in, in our city center project on the second floor, we overlook the plaza. And I've been there working some evenings where, um, and even on like a Friday or Saturday, or if, if we're there, and that project turns literally four or five times in an evening, right? So it's like early evening, young families are there. Then it's, you know, kind of older, empty nesters come. And it's like families with teenagers, and, and it goes all the way through those that are you know hanging out in the club till two in the morning, right? So, in a, in, a, in a really impactful way, I think we've done our job that you know we are an attractive destination for all those demographics, and quite frankly, there's incredible diversity uh, in terms of the people you know you see come through the project, and so. Um, that inherently is, is the underpinnings of, of building community. What time do we have to? Um, 15 more minutes, inclusive of QA. Oh. It's 11 30. Okay, but we got a bit QA in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go quickly. All right, environmental value. You already are bringing uh, the environmental value of the mixed use development as opposed to traditional Texas horizontal development. Right. So that's already pretty good. And then yeah. keeping the oak trees and moving them around, yeah. that touches on the sensory value as well. Yeah. So that's all, uh, I think that's going to bring a lot of oohs and ahs to it as well. Yeah. It was interesting at one point, um, we, we, we had a, a big debate internally about the 
need certifications. And my feeling is we were happy to, you know, we were already doing 95, if not 100 and more percent of what the need was. But if, if you looked at the money spent to get your lead certification, I mean, to me, it was sort of a, it was a marketing scam, right? But, you know, I was like, why, why, why do I need to spend that money? We're doing the right thing. And ultimately, right or wrong, some of our institutional partners said, that's a mandate. And, and for the right reasons, it was a mandate, right? And so, and so we started doing it. And at one point, someone kind of got wind of it and started giving us a hard time that some of the buildings at City Center were not LEED certified. And I made the very point you made. I said, we can do all that stuff on a standalone building, but you want to take City Center as the context, not a single building LEED certified. And, you know, the environmental impact we have of people not getting in their cars, you know, as often and all the time and staying in one place is vastly greater than, you know, whether I did a certain kind of air handler in, in the building. Now, generally we do go and get everything LEED certified these days, but it's, um, it, it, that was one of the, the great marketing campaigns of all time and because they took something, drove an agenda by essentially making it a market standard and it was incredibly smart. And I'm, I'm not against it. For us, it was just sort of that, you know, I can spend $200,000 somewhere else than paying a bunch of consultants to fill out the paperwork and you get a get a plaque at the end of the day. All right, last one, sensory value. This is always the tricky one. This is fun. Yeah. Again, it's on that walkable um, aspect of the development where I see it. Yeah. Like in city center, people like to be around people right. um, in an urban setting. And here, you don't really have that outside of Northgate, which is typically younger people who are a lot of times drunk. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I think. But, um, so this creates an alternative place for people that maybe are a little older and still want that urban setting, but are a little yeah. bit, um, have a different intention for the outcome of the night. Right. Um, so you need to see, see and be seen, as you said. Yeah. Uh, I think this actually will tie into cultural value, or at least the context portion of it. But whenever y'all hit everything with the Calvary, um, and y'all are trying to make a military base, as well as George with a railway and tying that into you know, College Station's rail um, history. Right. I feel like that really hits the sensory value on the head. Yeah. Well, I think that's about, that's about two things, right? It's about uh, cultural context, and then it's about authenticity, right? And actually, I could argue that Cavalry Court, we've maybe the pendulum swung a little too far in terms of sort of almost being thematic. I think George has a lot of nice references, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to kind of, the, re the references are subtle and you're kind of almost going to discover them, but when you walk in, the, you know, it's going to be a beautiful, uh, you know, small luxury hotel. But, uh, but I think that's right. I think it's, it's sort of that, that sense that, it's not anywhere here at USA and that someone took the time and effort to try to deliver, you know, a unique experience and an authentic experience. And, you know, be respectful of where you are, right? You know, if I think it's somewhat disrespectful if I picked up, you know, some project in some other city and just said, eh, we're just going to plunk that down in College Station. I mean, that's not being respectful of the community at that point and its heritage and its culture. Yeah. I uh, found out about the, hospital, the hotel in George, and I presume that it was tied into uh, the presidential library here. Is that at all the case? Or it it sort of was, yes and no. There's actually, there's a lot of famous Georges, and we're going to work that into the hotel at some point. It'll be kind of fun the way it works. But um, it, it, the two that, for whatever reason, we had a connection with, one was George Bush, the other one was George Mitchell, sort of the famous developer of the Woodlands. He was an Aggie civil engineer. And, um, but... Yeah, there's a lot of famous Georges, and, and candidly, it's sort of, and then, you know, if you have that connection, it's, it's <coughs> you know, from a marketing and branding standpoint, it's almost like you step back and go, well, is that even a cool name for a hotel? You know, it's, you know if it was the Fred, you might go, that doesn't sound quite as good as the George, but the George sort of, Fred in Fredericksburg. Yeah, at Fredericksburg, that would work. But, you know, the George sort of, it felt good. It felt, uh, felt, felt like, you know, that's somewhere I would stay, so. One piece of sensory value that struck me was the uh, 
visual textures and yeah. the diversity of textures, even right. just from uh, the pavement and yeah. paving stones rather than just flat concrete up to landscaping, yeah. and then the facades of <clears throat> the architecture as well. Yeah. I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the best sensory tools we have, and a lot of people aren't very good at it, and we try to spend a lot of time on it, is patios. And you know, it's interesting in certain climates how people say, oh, it's too hot, they won't sit outside, and you know, we were on our project tours. Remember, I told you the 27 projects in 17 cities. We were in Miami, and people were sitting on patios. Right? Miami is no better than climate than here. No more or less humid. And the reality is, it's how you do the patios. Right? Are they covered? Do they have fans? Are they in shade? Do they have landscaping? But there is nothing more visually stimulating than driving up to a project and seeing the activity of people sitting outside. And uh, and there, and there are so many things, right? You can pay attention to good smells and then bad smells, right? Something about trash, right? If we don't do trash the right way, that can be a huge negative. So it is truly all those senses. It is what is tactile, what do you see, what do you hear. You know, one of the reasons we have events and we do music, that's a sensory value, right? When you, you, you react to something differently when you hear music. It sort of automatically gives it a contextual reference. So we try to pay attention to, to all those things. So. All right, y'all did a good job on that. Video, maybe to touch on how a lot of these things impact value. So this is a little video we use and we send to office tenants when they say our rents are too high. And we're suddenly trying to convince them that not only are rents not high enough, but they should potentially pay us more. <laughs> so for most corporations, some major challenges that they face are recruiting new hires, helping them to be productive, and providing an environment with amenities to keep them there. City Center offers that amenity-rich campus without the expense of building and maintaining one. And, in addition to improving retention and attracting new employees, companies here at City Center are enhancing employee productivity. Okay, so what does that mean? For example, let's take a 270,000 square foot office space at an annual delta on rent of $4 per square foot. This equals $1,080,000. For a company with 1,080 employees, that is an average cost of $1,000 per employee per year. That's only 48 cents per employee per hour. Now, if we take into account the ease of access to world-class amenities such as dining, athletic, retail, hospitality, urban green spaces, and sophisticated residential choices, we can easily assume 30 minutes of increased productivity just from the amenities that City Center offers on campus. That is at least $2,970,000 in savings from increased productivity every single year. In the end, the extra few dollars a day you'll be spending starts to seem much more like an investment, where your return is better recruiting, retention, and productivity. All at City Center, where our people make the difference.
decision that drove that. I actually felt like, and the team felt like, you know, office, pre-leasing office is actually pretty difficult, especially in a smaller tenant market. Um, and so if we could prove that the original 60,000 feet really had a lot of value, I'll get there one day, um, you know, if these really worked well, then there was actually an opportunity to de densify those buildings. The reality is we also have this fantastic five-acre site, and then we have, this is about, what says Bryson, 24, 25, 30. <coughs> so that's about half the site, and so we still have another 30 acres. And I envision one day we may actually have corporate campuses towards the back. I think ultimately we will have companies for the reasons you just saw in that video come to us and say, okay, that's where we want to be. Can you build us a whatever, you know, 200,000 square foot building or 100,000 square foot building? So it, is, it, is, it was that balance of doing enough, right, to create the, the critical mass, and as people say, that to make sure that there was there, uh, but at the same time not giving up what are you know, potential opportunities. So, yes, Do you think people will park their premiums? Oh, yeah. Uh, we'll charge a lot. <laughs> uh, no, I, game days are going to be really fascinating because obviously we're going to be a natural place for people to come and congregate. Uh, and so we're going to be working with the university between our own parking and then also the bus system as to, you know, and it, it won't be easy, but uh, that's why John's here. He'll figure all that out for us. Uh, but, you know, there'll be a balance in there between, you know, Jenna will be planning all kinds of events for game day, so it's a great experience. And, you know, we know the restaurants and everyone will do well. The hotels will do well. So, you know, and, and we fight this all the time, right? The balance is between our job is to make our tenants successful, and yet you don't want to limit people who want to come to experience community and not necessarily spend a dollar. And it, it's kind of, in some respects, those are a little bit opposing at times. Um, but at the same time, when you build the destination, it is about awareness, right? Just because someone doesn't eat at that restaurant that time, that seed has been planted and they're like, oh, I should come back to Moe's, that looks great. And so it's kind of where's that balance. And it, it's not, I'm not going to tell you it's going to be easy when we don't have it all figured out. What happens is you live through a few. John's going to live through a season and it'll probably take a season to figure it out and then we'll, then we'll have it, so... How's that for a non-answer? <laughs> Anybody else? Yes? Okay, this is kind of looking into the future, but what are your plans for the Madden for phase two, and how do you plan to kind of develop the continuity of like, this pedestrian uh, center and focus into that phase two? Jeffrey said y'all are going to figure that out, and that's what we're going to give this to you. <laughs> that's what it is. See, see what you guys can dream up for, for phase two. You know, I'll go back. We don't know. I think in here, like 100 Park, I might be totally wrong, but I think that's just going to be a slam dunk. And I think, you know, we, we could build, you know, 200 Park probably six months after 100 Park opens. And so I think inherently you're going to see a lot of the same uses. We're not going to be able to cont continue growing just tons of retail. I think the, you know, the... The universe of square footage of retail is probably 250,000. Um, we are, are talking to a grocer op operator. I think a grocer would be a great addition to the project. Um, it's, it's, you know, grocery is one of those things that draws community traffic, but it's also a great amenity. You know, if I'm staying in the hotel and I want to walk over and get something, or I'm, um, you know, I'm an office tenant and I can just walk over and get something from the grocery store, it's great. So I would say incrementally some more retail. There are some other anchor uses like grocery store. And then a lot of it, I think, is going to be residential and office opportunities. And there may be an opportunity for a third hotel. I think ultimately what we're going to prove up is um, everybody underestimated you know, the real opportunity for hospitality in this market. That being said, you've got, you know, you got the Atlas of Traditions, and then you know, A&M insisted on building one on top of a parking garage across from the stadium, um, which we were somewhat displeased with, but it won't, the, the reality is neither of those will offer what we offer. And, uh, and it may be there's room for all four of those to be successful, which would be the best case scenario. While we're competitive, we don't necessarily want others to fail. I mean, what you want is all of them to be successful um, and then hopefully create other opportunities. So. Yep. John made a good 
comment. We should have put bicycles on here. Okay, so that slide I just had up is basically that dark gray area. Inside this white line is all the new student housing uh, that we built. And so we have this piece here along college, and then we have this kind of piano-shaped piece here. And so, and ultimately, the university owns a piece of property here, and we've talked about, you know, as, it, I mean, actually there's beautiful property back here, it's got some topography to it, but the idea that this street here that connects to the light, um, I would like to see, we would like to see this sort of go through to Rosemary. I think it'd be a great connection for, for Brian without having to hit this intersection. Um, but I, this is where I can kind of see corporate campuses ultimately growing and expanding into the project. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm two minutes over. Wait. One more. One sir, more burning question. Yes, sir. This one's burning. This actually, I'd like to direct this to kind of the whole the whole team. Yeah. Uh, there's a number of us here that are interested in, and active in like the Congress for New Urbanism and Houston Tomorrow and right. and a lot of these groups that champion uh, building on on the human scale versus the automobile scale. And so I was just curious for for you know any members of the team if there was any you know have, are y'all active in those organizations? Have you read? Uh, are, are there any that really? I guess drove the vision for Century Square. I'm thinking, you know, Andreas Duani and guys like that. Maybe Donald Sheets. Yeah. You know, work on parking because yeah. it seems very inherent in your project. Yeah, I, I mean, I was. And these guys can answer. Um, I mean, ULI is the one I look to the most. I've always been heavily involved, and I think that's sort of the biggest, most inclusive tent, both from those concepts and then each of the uses. Right. I mean, there are members there that are multifamily people, office, retail. Um, but, you know, their first mixed-use development book was written, and I have a copy of it, but, I mean, a long time ago. It was, like, in the 70s or 80s, I think. Um, so that's kind of the one I look to. I, mean, I don't know if y'all think any different. But. Yeah. Um, I'm involved in the Central Houston kind of downtown revitalization effort. Trying to bring – downtown has a tunnel system that's underground. A lot of the retail and restaurant uh, tenants are all underground, so it's not very active at the street level. So it's, it's a kind of a young professional group just um, starting the conversation, trying to get some momentum about bringing that life downtown. Yeah. Similar. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I just want to bring something full circle. Uh, there was actually, in uh, this class, I believe, maybe 15, 20 years ago, they actually did various designs for us yeah. for phase one. Right. And I, it would be, I don't, it's probably a um, Somewhere and interestingly, our our first master plan I should have we should have included it, but um, I'll just use this one was actually we we, we kind of had this original strong bias to this intersection, so the whole property was planned on a diagonal going through, and it sort of had a a smaller circular plaza here and then a big one here, um, and ultimately that changed because of what happened here. Um, and then we went to kind of what I think is a more traditional urban plan. But I remember some of the original concepts uh, were not dissimilar to kind of that orientation on that corner. But that's, they were good. All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, hang on for a second, please. Uh, with the uh, uh, architecture students on this project and I'm just delighted to be working again on an interdisciplinary learning collaboration with our band of kindred spirits and friends, uh, Dr. Young Reno, Dr. Uh, Julian Kang and Professor Jeffrey Booth. I'm especially pleased to say that Julian, myself and Jeffrey are all Reagan interdisciplinary faculty uh, fellows. So, uh, so Tom's uh, legacy kind of lives on. 
And, and the learning experience is greatly enriched by sharing this owner's view, the art, the designer's view, and the construction view all in one kind of uh, activity. And um, thank you to Jonathan and the team from Midway for your generosity and enthusiasm. Uh, we're <coughs> delighted to be working with you this semester. It's going to be a, a, a great time. And thanks also for Dean Venegas for his... Uh, uh, unwavering support for interdisciplinary activity and thanks to Dr. Miranda you know, and the CRS Center for uh, sharing his deep allegiance to interdisciplinary activity uh, and enabling the uh, what we're calling the CRSC Collaborative Studio. So uh, uh, thanks for all, all of you people for uh, helping out in this. And Julian? Okay, uh, this is our second interdisciplinary class project that I'm working with Mark Clayton and uh, Professor uh, Jeffrey Boos and I'm excited about this opportunity and um, uh, students uh, participating in this class project from construction science department are those who are taking uh, my building information modeling uh, courses and uh, they're taking that class uh, hoping to learn how to enhance their communication in the course of construction using a visual representation of the project and then uh, uh, none of them are able to pick up that skill without putting their hands on actual um, application and then work on the project so naturally I've been looking for a class project for years and I've been actually working with many general contractors for years uh, before uh, last year when uh, uh, Dr. Clayton and Jeffrey uh, Booth uh, suggested to come up with an interdisciplinary class project between three uh, departments and I liked the idea and then uh, we uh, had a chance to work with the uh, River Tree Academy project uh, which was a huge success. Our students learned not only how to use the building information modeling to enhance their communication but also they had a chance to work with students from other departments. I bet uh, uh, students from uh, uh, architecture and the landscape architecture also had a chance to learn. I had to uh, work with uh, students from construction science department as well. So uh, we uh, learned some lessons and then uh, this uh, semester we are lucky to work with the Midway uh, team again to uh, come up with a, another interdisciplinary class project and I'm really excited about this opportunity. And um, this semester we will try to bring something new as well uh, as, uh, uh, as we uh, move on the, for the construction project, uh, which is uh, a new emerging technology, uh, 3D printing and the BIM cave. Uh, after creating the building information model to explain your class project, we will try to encourage you guys to use a 3D printer to actually print out the components of the building and then assemble them together to understand the construction processes. Also, we'll have a chance to enhance collaboration and communication between the team members. Also, we will try to use, have you guys to use the beam cave, which is a huge video wall of a 36 strings projecting the images of the building information models uh, to, for the final presentation. So uh, some of you guys will have a chance to use the BIM cave to explain what you have uh, come up with for the phase two of the, of the, uh, the Century uh, uh, Square project. In order to just close these proceedings, I have a, a couple of thoughts. I have one very major regret, and that is that there weren't uh, very, very many more architecture, construction, landscape architecture, and urban planning students over here to listen to this presentation. Because I think something very significant is going on here. Uh, when I read those three sentences to you, I left out a sentence in the middle in the hope that something would happen, and it did. And so now I'm going to fill in that sentence in the middle uh, 
and it goes like this. The new way is by team. Almost any team can produce mere shelter, but to produce environments which are good, livable environments takes a new kind of team, one sensitive to human needs and values. And I have to congratulate Jonathan and his group for bringing that, a vision of somebody from 50 years ago, back to College Station. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you. We also need to thank the staff of the Annenberg Center. They always provide us with fabulous service. Mark, Jennifer, Ayoga Round, and everybody else, all the other staff. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe Robert and Garrett have some little bags over there in there. <laughs> They're going to do something with that, so Robert yes. and Garrett, Thank please you. come up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have, we do have gifts for uh, Jonathan and your Midway Development team. Uh, we really appreciate you all taking your time on Tuesday, or yeah, last Tuesday, to show us the site and coming out to talk to us. Uh, one thing that really struck me there's a lot that's really fascinating about this project. Um, one thing that's really powerful is that they're partnered with the A&M at an institutional level with the lease, um, the land lease, and then working with them as a tenant. But they're also, they're connected at the top, but they're also taking the time to come in at the ground floor, working with us students, making it an educational experience for us. So really, it's a holistic thing, and we really appreciate that. Um, and let's everyone give them a hand there. After this, um, it was an RSVP lunch, so if you've RSVP'd, then uh, please join us. We do have the list of who all is there. <laughs> um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Miranda, Dean Menegas, uh, the staff, and Dr. Booth for putting this together. Appreciate all of you.